All right, so this is development two. This is a tough week, though, honestly, and this isn't me just saying this. Um, it is a tough week. It is probably the harder of the three. Week one is kind of like awkward for me, but it's not that hard. You guys did really well on your test. Uh, development three is not that hard. It has a couple trickier things, but it's really not that hard. Uh, development two has the most content, and it will be all over that AP exam. Guarantee you. Um, the con one of the concepts I'm starting today is going to have three questions on today that will be on your test on Thursday. So your reflexes I'm covering and I'm doing a sensory motor stage. So and I'll get to all that today. Um, so development two is picking up from birth to puberty. And then development three is going to be from puberty to death. It's development. So here we go. All right. So um, when you're born, and I have no videos of birthing, because that's like traumatic, traumatic. Um, there's none of that. Now, the cool thing is, and I really didn't realize until I started teaching, and I have, even after I took AP Psych, my AP Psych teacher, it was my Murphy, um, and I love him, but he's super, super awkward. I'm really awkward, but he is like the most awkward person. So he never taught development. Like at all, he just didn't want to talk about it. Just, yeah, it, it was just overlooked. So a lot of this stuff, I try to not be as the biggest weirdo in the whole wide world, but I want you to know I'm uncomfortable because I don't want you asking it questions, up. huh? Pretty good. Um, no, I'm really uncomfortable, but I think there's some things you should know. Anyway, so one of the some of the cool facts about babies, and it's really going to end today because I don't like babies, and I'll give you some weird experiences I've had with babies, but there's some cool things. When a baby is born, it's the first time when they, like, fall out. When you catch them. Yeah, when you catch them. Yeah. <laughs> it's the first time. So as soon as you catch the baby, okay, the first thing the doctor's going to do is going to grab this, like, suction kind of thingy, shove it down the baby's throat, and suck up a bunch of the goop. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. They're going to suck up the goop from inside um, the baby's mouth. And that is going to be the first time the baby's lungs have ever been used when they scream out for the first time. Isn't that like a critical moment? Like yeah. Well, yeah, then it's not going to work Wait, and then so the baby's going to die. What about when you didn't have the um, They would flip it over and they would kind of... <laughs> or they would take their fingers and go through. So now, rough. you have to understand, guys, that we are evolutionary to survive. Babies are not born useless. They're born with certain devices, which we call reflexes, that allow babies to thrive. When we're born, a lot of things happen for the very first time. Our lungs are being used for the first time. Remember, when you are in the womb, you have your mother's placenta that's attached to you, um, is giving you all the oxygen. So there's no reason for your lungs to work because there's no air to breathe because you're in goop. That's not the scientific term, but we're just going to roll with it. Okay? So... Um, once you are born, it's the first time your lungs have been used. It's also the first time your stomach's been used. Now, um, so being born in a hospital really became in fashion in the 1950s. 1940s, towards the end, after World War II, people started going to the hospital. The baby boomers, which are the babies born post-World War II, are really going to start being, are being born in the 1950s. That's when people are going to the hospitals for the first time. There's two major changes that happen to women. Starting in the 1950s on, it's the first time women are lying down to give birth. Do you know why we are lying in bed? It's because it's easier for the doctor to uh, look and check the cervix and stuff like that. It's actually not easier for the woman to give birth that way. Is it better to squat? You stand. No, there's people around. It's not like you're just... I feel like that's uncomfortable. Why? So instead of having gravity help you in something that you're naturally supposed to be doing, historically, since the dawn of time, women have been standing, you're right, let's lie sideways so we have to push laterally. That sounds terrible. Would you rather go downhill or push on a plane? It hurts. I wouldn't want to stand up. Yeah, or put it like a basket. Yeah. Okay. A basket? <laughs> but like in the tub. That's better in the tub. Just yeah. kidding. <laughs> my child told me the first period that women used to give birth underwater a lot. I see my what? cousin do it. <laughs> natural birth. It was water so birth. Water, water because like they don't use it because they still don't need their lungs until they No, she was like 
like on a ball, like on a bouncy like yoga ball. She was what? doing it naturally. Okay, okay, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> I'm not ready for this. We're moving on. And by the way, everyone's hearing this. <laughs> but, uh, everyone's hearing this. <laughs> you see it? Not yes. recording this again. Goop right. came out. Oh, the lie. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Anyway, we're moving forward. Okay, so. Since the 1950s, remember, in the 1950s, the transition shifts from what women need into what makes it easier for doctors to get in there and protect. Because remember, uh, giving birth is a really traumatic thing, and women still die giving birth to this day. It's obviously not as common, especially here in the United States, but women are still dying because of birth. Because, like, there's something inside that's coming outside. Like, that, there's a lot of things going on, so things can go wrong. Um, so what happened is if, up until the last like 10 years when a baby's born the doctors and the nurses swoop in and take the baby and they start counting toes they clean it out you know they're cleaning it up before they present it back to the mother and doctors realize it's actually not a good thing um, it stresses out the baby more so what is happening now when you give birth now is they take the baby as soon as like they catch it like ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's really what happens. If they once they catch, I don't know if that's how it happens either. But we're gonna go with it. Once they catch the baby, or get the baby, or rip, I don't know, whatever. Rip it out. They. I don't know. Bye. 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 What? Or how about yeah. it squirts out? I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> Where is just stop? <laughs> Anyway, the moment it comes out, they put it right onto the mom's chest. And why do they put it right on the mom's chest? Awesome. You can tell me why with a hand. Simone. Um, well, the mom's releasing all these hormones right then that will allow her to like, instantly bond with the baby. For bonding experience, absolutely. And it's also to help soothe the baby because the baby is put immediately right onto the heart. But so the heart is also, he they're they just, hearing the heart. They, and you stuff. do that after the session that we're doing, right? Um, they clear it really quick. And I, when it's on the mother's chest, then they do all that stuff. <laughs> They're trying to clear it up. Oh, okay. Okay, so they put the uh, the child right onto the chest. It soothes the mother. The bonding experience between the mother and the child is also allowing the kid to have some sort of a skin conduct. All that stuff is good. Um, also, digestion. Immediately, as soon as they possibly can, once they check the baby is viable, everything is good, they have the mother bre breastfeed the baby ASAP. Okay, now this once the baby starts breastfeeding, it's the first time their stomach, their esophagus, all this stuff has ever been used for the first time. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. Well, yeah, but can you imagine? Oh, anyway, moving on. Circulation. Okay, the heartbeat has always been beating. It's not like your heart starts the moment you're born. It's been beating, but it hasn't been in charge of all of moving, all the blood flow and all that stuff. For the first time, once the baby's born, that is the first time it is responsible for all blood movement, which is, there's two reasons why the babies typically come out bluish. A, they've just been squeezed out of this little teeny tiny little thing. Okay? It's pretty tiny. Why are they like all flaky? Yeah. Because they're like gooped up. And they also, their hearts aren't used to it. So it's the first time, especially as soon as they cut the umbilical cord, their heart is trying to like, oh my God, we're going. Oh, okay, this is all me now. Here we go. And they're trying to get the heartbeat up to pace. So it's kind of those major things. They're also having to deal with temperature regulation. One of the biggest issues that young parents have is figuring out temperature regulations. Because if you get, if your baby gets too hot, it can die. If it gets too cold, it can die. You have to find this middle ground. The middle ground is pretty big, but you still have to be paying attention to it. Uh, babies can't regulate their own temperature. They're not sweating. <laughs> so we regulate our temperature is sweating, and we can obviously, oh, this is hot. Let's take this off. They're not able to do that. Um, not until later. I don't really know when. But uh, body temperature regulation, they're trying to start kind of manulating that. But this is the first time they're doing it at all. Beforehand, obviously, the mother is, like, baking them. So, you know, the mom's making the regulation. Yes. So how do they do it in like 18 times? What do you mean, like birth? Yeah, well, like temperature regulation specifically. Like they would wrap really them up in the desert, and it's really hot in the desert. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the Egyptians have been doing pretty well, I guess. I don't yeah, know. Like, they, 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 like, like, yeah, but you don't just put the baby out in the baking sun. Right. They, they put like, like wet they have fans and stuff. Yeah. But they didn't have like 
Okay, what if it was really cold? But our babies like, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. All right, three, two. This is the start of your study guide, by the way. This is the top thing. Here we go. So, infants, they have five reflexes. You need to know what each reflex does. You just don't write down these are the five. There are two questions on this on your test, right here. So, the first one is sucking. Remember how I said um, what we're doing now with babies is we put the baby right onto the mother's chest. The mother's not wearing like a like a not wearing like a long sleeve t-shirt quite like myself. They typically have um, the breasts available so the baby can feed ASAP in order to have that bonding time. Okay, so the sucking is that the baby has to know the baby's mouth has never been used, so you can't say, "Hey, by the way, welcome, happy birthday." Now you're going to start going on the mother's breast. The baby has to know, and that's what the sucking thing, the sucking reflex is. If you've ever put your finger in a baby's mouth, what does it do? It starts sucking on it. Anything, like if, it, if you put it up to your cheek and you kind of leave it there, it'll start sucking on your cheek. It's just weird. It's so weird. It's so weird. It's gross. Anyway, so sucking is so when the baby meets the mother's bre uh, breast, it can essentially start feeding immediately and knows exactly what to do. Rooting reflex is with the brush of the cheek, the baby's face <coughs> turns. I'd write that down. With the brushing of the cheek, the baby's head turns. Now, the reason why if you touch a baby's cheek is because the baby has to figure out that the nipple is where food and nourishment comes from. So rooting reflex is about a baby finding the nipple. Okay? So if you touch a baby's cheek, so if you're hanging out with a baby this week for Thanksgiving, good luck to you. No thank you. Um, if you touch its cheek, it's going to turn its head to it. And you can literally do it for hours and hours and hours. It's going to sit there and keep doing it. It's out of its control. A lot of people say that if you do it, if a baby's crying and you start doing it, it'll make it stop. Well, that's annoying. Yeah, but I mean, like, how annoying? The baby is going to be like, this is awful but <laughs> I can't stop <laughs> and it's a rooting reflex it's looking for the nipple so when um, for instance when you're breastfeeding as soon as it feels it against its face it moves its head to, in order to reach the nipple but yeah if you touch a baby's cheek it's gonna move towards the touch it literally just rocks its head back and forth <laughs> apparently I mean that would if I was really upset and you kept doing that and I kept having to turn I guess I'd forget why I was upset too <laughs> so, they, when they're born, they can sweat from their foreheads, but like nowhere else. Which, first of all, babies are always sweating foreheads. Like, it's very, it's like, anyway. It's, <laughs> <laughs> and babies can't sweat for like. Up until normal age or whatever. <laughs> Alright, here we go. Alright, your next one is the Moro, which is the startle reflex. This is when a baby throws their arms and feet outward. So think about it, especially when you think about reflexes. They're supposed to prevent, uh, protect us from our caveman <coughs> nemesis, like bears and cats and dogs. I guess, no, I take back the cats and dogs, but that's fine. Um, so if an animal was approaching a baby, they're trying to make themselves as big as possible, so they're as scary as possible. And that's why. So if any, any loud noise, the baby's going to go, Wah! and it is to make themselves as big as possible, hopefully to trigger a response. <laughs> they all do it. Is that what, like when they start crying and they're like stretched out? Or yeah. Not? To a degree, if they're scared. But they're so small. Yeah. Well, yes, sweetie. No one's saying no, it makes them into a bear size. What do you need to do to be <laughs> Well, you're going to get eaten. <laughs> yeah, but this is something. something better. Well, it's something. All right, the next one is grasping. Um, Keep in mind that the baby has to stabilize itself in order to drink the breast, uh, breast milk, in order to um, receive all that. So grasping is there to hold on to make it easier for them to support themselves. Now keep in mind, no one is saying a baby has the brute strength to hold on to you while you're breastfeeding just sway around. Like, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, did you just get a visual? <laughs> It's been a really long day. So I got home last night really late, and Toby just lost his damn mind. So I got like three hours of sleep. He does. So I got like two and a half hours of sleep. It was awful. So 
34 more minutes. Here we go. So the um, grasping, if you, have, have, if you have ever held a baby, you know they just hold on to your clothes and like this weirdly strong death grip. <laughs> <laughs> or and like they grab your hair, which is the worst. Yeah. And the necklace, they have to hold on to. The reason is, is because A, it's a reflex, so they just have to do it. And the reason why it's there is so they can have some stability while they're breastfeeding, so their face isn't going, ah. <laughs> 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 and finally the Babinski which is my favorite the Babinski is if anything touches the baby's foot the baby goes and moves its feet it does what? <laughs> it moves its feet it kind of kicks its feet a little bit the reason is think about it think about our caveman ancestors if anything happened to their feet during infancy would they survive? no, no. they can't walk they can't travel they can't feed themselves can't do anything so um, anything that touches their feet, they automatically move their feet for two responses. A, for protection. they got to protect their feet or they're not going to survive. And B, it also triggers a walking motion because if a, if a caveman doesn't walk, they're going to die. So you want to have that kind of natural response to walking. I don't know why I need to keep doing that since my is really the only one who can see it. But that's okay. All right, so those are your five. You need to be able to identify because there is an example of one, and you have to be able to identify. Any questions on those? Okay. Um, when a baby's born, the only sense they have a really strong um, development to is um, their mouth. Their mouth has the most nerves and has the most sensations out of any part. In their hands, they have very little feeling because there's no nerves developing yet. As they get older, you get more feeling in your limbs, your arms, and stuff like that. Think about it. When you're in the womb, they're just trying to develop the most important parts. Everything else will come as you grow. So that's why babies put everything in their mouth. It's the most sensitive part of their body, which means they can feel it more and get more detail and information from it. Um, there you go. So, here is your grasping. Here is your, are you terrified? It's a startle reflex. She's trying to show you she's really big. Here is your rooting reflex. See the kids chasing the touch of the cheek. Here is your uh, Babinski. He's moving his feet with anything touches. That's why babies, when someone picks up their baby and puts them on the ground, see he's walking. No, no, you touched his feet. If you had him on his back and you touched his feet, he'd be doing the same thing. Just, just saying. And then you have, of course, your uh, sucking. There you go. No. <laughs> that first one's really cute. The little hand. Oh, that's so cute. They're so funny. The second one's a little scary. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. There is nothing on your study guide. However, um, you should know this for A for life, and B, it could be on your IP exam, so all you have to do is listen. So how development is tracked is through milestones. If you go through like a pediatrician book, apparently there's like 36,000 things you're supposed to be able to do by the time you hit um, 18, which makes sense, correct? Makes sense. Because your pediatrician is supposed to follow you until you're 18. Once you hit 18, then you're supposed to get a real doctor. Not that they're not real doctors. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. Like, yeah, you get like a grown-up doctor. And then, anyway, so I'm not helping myself, so I'm moving forward. Okay, <laughs> so with milestones, okay, you have to go from one to the next to the next. So you can't learn how to run before you learn how to lie in your tummy, correct? You have to do one and the other. Now, milestones are really, 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 really important. Um, if you're not hitting your milestones, like when babies are born, they don't raise their hand and say, hi, hi mom, I have a psychological disorder and I'm going to be slow to evolve. Just want to let you know. <laughs> That's not what they're saying. Or they're not like, hey mom, um, I have a physiological disorder, just wanted you to know, and start crying. Like you have to kind of figure it out so you can offer the assistance and stuff that you need. Milestones give us that insight. Obviously, milestones aren't going to show us everything. However, it does give us great insight. I do have a personal story with this. My mom's best friend, his name's Ju her name's Judy. She just passed, actually, last year. But, um, yeah, she had breast cancer three times. Yeah. 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 So, um, anyway, um, Toledo is still talking crap, just so you know. 
Um, so anyway, Judy and her son, Matthew, um, came up to our summer house up in Massachusetts, up in New Hampshire. Uh, they came up for the weekend. And I was 10, Matthew's four years younger than me, so he's six. So you pulled into the parking, like the little parking spots, like a gravel little lot. Then you would walk up the stairs, and then you'd go up another flight of stairs, and then you'd be in a, like our screened-in porch. So that's kind of how this whole place is laid out. So anyway, well, we just came back from the beach, and so I was like running up the stairs, and Matthew was chasing me, and he went up the stairs like really, really, really slowly, like really on, um, not coordinated. And my mom, and for some reason, my mom called me back down, and then she made me run up the stairs again, and then she told Judy, because I was like, why are you making me do this? And I was listening to her talk to Judy, and she, my mom was like, Judy, that's weird. You know, have you told your doctor? Like, that's weird. Does he always do this? And she's like, yeah, he's just not very fast up stairs. My mom's like, that's weird. You should really talk to your doctor. And Judy's like, it's not that big of a deal. And my mom's like, nah, you really should talk to your doctor. And she's like, fine, when I get back to Boston, we'll go to the doctor. So the next week, she takes Matthew to his pediatrician, and they do a couple blood tests. Matthew has cerebral palsy. They discovered it when he was age six in New Hampshire. The week after they came back from my mom's house, my mom saw that he was not doing things I could do at age six. Matthew wasn't doing it. My mom was like, that's weird. You should talk to your doctor. That's how important milestones are. What is that? Cerebral palsy is essentially when your muscles kind of turn to stone. They just don't work. The connective tissue doesn't really work. He's now on a breathing machine, and he is on a uh, feeding machine. He will not make it through the year. Yeah, he's four years younger than me. He was supposed to die at age 18. They usually don't make it past age 18. So he was diagnosed at age six after going to my mom, because my mom saw that something was weird. Like, that's weird. He should be able to do this by now. And um, Judy went, and her whole life changed. That is what milestones are about. If your child is not doing something by the time an average or a healthy baby is, it's an indicator there's something psychologically or physiologically there. Jimbo, you know how I told you about Jimbo? Jimbo never crawled until he was two years old. He didn't fully walk on his own until he was six. That shows you something's wrong, do you see? That's why milestones are so important. As parents, you always hear parents are like, well, he's not walking yet. He should be walking. And it's like a really stressful thing. Have you heard parents talk about it? The reason why is because the longer it's delayed, the more likely it is that there's something psychologically or physiologically wrong with the kid. Because babies don't come out and say, hey, by the way, I have this. By the way, <laughs> there's no label saying, ah, I have this disorder, you know, like you got to figure it out. The earlier you figure it out, the more treatment options you have, the better it is. Milestones give us those options. You need to make sure you're paying attention. Isn't parenthood terrifying? Yeah. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. What are they doing? Um, so the first thing you're supposed to do, and uh, I only know this because of social media. When you have your own kids, no one cares about tummy time. No one cares. Yeah, you need to be doing it with your kid. No one on social media cares you're doing tummy time. This is tummy time. What tummy time is all about is the kid being able to lift his head on his own accord. Obviously, heads are really heavy. Um, if he's able to lift his head while he's on his tummy and kind of look up and look around, it shows that he's developing the muscle strength in the back of his body, which means his muscle retention is, or her muscle retention is good. Then you have the turning. Baby can go from stomach to back, okay? Then you have being able to sit up, propped up. Then you have being able to sit on his own accord. He's so proud of himself, look at him, <laughs> look at him. Uh, being able to crawl, and then of course being able to walk. Those are your basic ones. Oh, I have no idea. Oh yeah, but when you're like a child, like when you go to like your pediatrician, it'll be broken down for you. They give you like charts and stuff. Like this is when this should be happening. This they're gonna hold your hand through the whole process. Like your pediatrician, like is like a huge deal, and like they kind of walk you through this whole thing. So it's not like they give you a baby and you just go home and like ah, don't kill it. 
<laughs> you know, they're giving you the guidance and stuff like that. But like milestones are a really, 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 really big part of that. And making sure you know where, th where things are and how your kid fits in in order to kind of help them if you can. All right. Immunizations. What? Yeah, maybe you wouldn't be able to pull its head up. What would, what would that mean? That you oh, beyond my pay grade, girl. I have no idea. I don't need to know, so I don't know. That's how I live my life. Immunizations are something that you are given on week two of life, you start. Now, immunizations, let me tell you the history of immunizations. In the 15th century, uh, people realized that if you took blood from a cow that has been infected with, like, smallpox and stuff, and that you inject just a little bit of blood in, of that blood into your blood, you could live. So what would happen is people would walk around with an infected cow, they would take a needle, prick the cow, get a little blood, get you, shove it in your blood, blood stream, and then the blood would mix. And they would literally sit there and go, all right, next kid. The reason is, is because what essentially immunizations are, it's a vaccine. What it actually is, it's a little taste of the disease a small amount that your body will be exposed to, learn how to fight it, because a, a disease in a small uh, batch is easier to defend and defeat than having a full-on smallpox explosion. Does that make sense? So the, you would get it. It would be injected into you or it pricked into you. Okay, You'd get sick, but you would be, your body would be able to fight it off because it wasn't a full-blown infection. And then your antibodies will remember that infection, and next time it's presented it, we'll be able to know exactly what to do so you're not going to die of it. That is the basics of immunizations vaccines. Today, when you get your shots, people just call them shots. They don't call them vaccines anymore. People are like, oh, i got to go get my shots. You know, he's up for his four-month, six-month shots and stuff like that. Um, they're not coming from a cow. Obviously, they're a prex. Someone asked me today, do they still have the cow? <laughs> no, no. They're made in a factory. Of, I don't know what they're made of. I have no idea. I doubt they're blood blood. They're probably just, I don't know, Google it. It's like protein and stuff. Yeah. That's why people who are like allergic to eggs can't have shots. That's the thing. There you go. See? Okay. So, the reason why this has become... <laughs> okay, so this has become a big issue here in 2016. It really started in 2009. So there's a woman named Jenny McCarthy, who her claim to fame is a TV show called Singled Out. It's a dating show on MTV, where she was the pretty thing to look at, and men said terrible things to her. That was the show premise. That was really it. She got her, vac her son vaccinated, and she swears up and down that her son got autism because of vaccines. So she started this whole movement and started wrote a book about it, did all this stuff. Now, please keep in mind, she was on MTV as a... She's very pretty, talking about vaccines and how it gave her son autism. Since then, a lot of people have decided not to give their children vaccines so much so that when you're a little kid you get vaccines for polio you get vaccines for smallpox you get vaccines for tuberculosis and a ton of other stuff so many people aren't getting vaccines in certain places like in california new york that we have polio back we eradicated polio in the united states we've eradicated smallpox we've eradicated Measles, typhoid fever, we've eradicated, which means they do not exist. However, since people have stopped vaccinating their children, guess what's back? Polio. Back again. <laughs> there, there was an SVU episode about it. There was a kid who had measles. Really? Well, oh, yeah. What show? And, like, they were, like, suing him for infecting right. the other people. Yeah, and because it was, it was, like, all these, like, um, it was, like, these preppy rich kids at the school. The mom was, like, um... <laughs> Oh, I don't want to give my kids vaccine. I believe the whole school got measles so that she would infect the other kids so they would be like um, to Did oh, she yeah. ask her what they Okay. Yeah. Listen, yeah. this is why it's important for vaccines to occur. A, we don't want diseases we can officially eradicate to come back. But the real reason is, is that children who are, babies who are born with diseases, with uh, issues, disorders, whatever, they're not, they cannot get vaccines. 
or elderly and stuff like that, but mostly we focus on the younger ones. Um, they can't get their vaccines. So as healthy babies, like I am a healthy baby, I have a lot of issues, but I was a healthy baby when I was born, I got vaccines. By the healthy people who are the way large majority get vaccinated, these diseases die out so we can protect the kids who can't get vaccinated. Does that make sense? So when healthy people refuse to get vaccinated, and we already have a population that can't get vaccinated for one reason or another, that makes that population of kids who just can't get vaccinated way more susceptible to diseases and stuff on top of those healthy kids who aren't vaccinated. Now, there has been study after study after study by the top universities around the world testing if autism is caused by vaccines, and there has been zero correlation, zero correlation. Even my father, who believes global change is a lie, <laughs> believes vaccines do not cause autism. Okay? You need to get your kids vaccinated. If it's not just for your kid, it's for the kids who can't. So if you know anyone, typically, who has born with cancer or anything like that, they can't get vaccinated, do it for that kid. Now, as you get older, up until you're 18, you're going to have to get vaccines. Like when you get go to college, if you live on campus, you're gonna have to get your meningitis something. Huh? Yeah. Oh, they're like ten bucks or five bucks. Yeah. If you go to a college campus and you live on campus, they require a vaccine. It's like meningitis. Yeah, it's something. I know. There's a really sad commercial about it. Some kid is like, bye, mom. And then two days later, he's in the hospital. Like, and then, like, you were fine two days ago. And then you hear, yeah, it, like, melts your brain. It's pretty cool. What? Like, the disease, the little the thingy. I don't know. It's like meningitis every once in a while. Yeah, it's really bad. Meningitis, like, if you live, you're going to be like, that. Mental retard. Yeah, it's really, really bad. Do you only need it once? Huh? So you get it once or You get it once and you're done. Yeah. So that's immunizations. You need to get your vaccines. Every once in a while, there was a kid at USF who had it a couple of years ago when McCray was going there. There was a kid who got it. They already had it, but the kids who were on campus who did not, who didn't live on campus weren't required to do it. Can we disagree vaccines are a good thing? So please get yourself vaccinated when it becomes, and get your damn kids vaccinated. In some, con in some countries, in some states here in the United States, like if you live in California and you refuse to get your kids vaccinated, which as a parent you have that choice to be vaccinate, vaccinate your parent, kid or not, if you refuse to vaccinate your child in the state of California, you cannot attend public school. They passed that law three years ago to combat it because it's becoming an issue. Um, New York has embraced it, Massachusetts has also embraced it, and a couple other states ratified it um, in the last in the election. Like a doctor, a doctor. Well, if you are born with cancer there's an, and your immune system has been completely wiped out, they're not going to say, oh my god, we've got to give you smallpox, so vaccine, no. They're going to say, you are going to be protected by the population. And they can attend public schools in the state. Yes, because it's not their fault they can't get vaccinated. If your parent no, believes you. Jenny McCarthy is correct, then you don't belong in public schools. All right, cognitive development. Okay, so underneath, on your study guide, you're going to see cognitive development in the box. You're going to write PJ, which is right above it. In PJ's box, you're going to write cognitive development. So in cognitive development, you're going to write this. The definition. There's always people who do that. People just want to be yeah, on TV. Like people are idiots. All right, so cognitive development. Now, PJ is going to be the guy behind this big theory. Now, this theory is humongous. I'm going to spend pretty much all day Monday talking about it. I have a video of kids. We're going to be tricking them. It's going to be awesome. We're going to be playing little pranks on them. They're going to look like morons because they're dum-dums. <laughs> or PJ would say they just haven't cognitively developed enough. I prefer dum-dums. 
All right, so cognitive development is the development of thinking, problem solving, memory, scheme, mental concepts. For your box, I'm going to borrow this for two seconds. So, you know how you have the cognitive definition, which you're writing right now? Underneath cognitive development, you have sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operations, formal operations. You're going to write that in the application. You're going to write one, sensory motor, two, pre-operational, three, concrete operational, four, uh, formal operational. Those are the layers. Yeah, that's in order. It goes down in order. You need to write them in order. If you don't know your order of PJ, you're completely screwed. Don't show up on Thursday to take the test. There's a question where it's literally the order. There's a multiple questions on during what stage is this mastered. Like, if you don't know your orders or your stage, you're in big trouble. So, in your application, you're just going to write down the next four boxes underneath cognitive development in order. That is the order you need to know. And I'm going to go through and explain, of course, what each order, what stage is. Sounds good? How is it not 3 o'clock? Can we just talk about that for a second? I know. Oh my god. <laughs> Freedom! What? I know, Kat. I can't get, wait to get away from you. I hope not. I haven't looked at my schedule. I haven't gotten an email on my schedule yet. My boss. Schedule for what? My other job? What is he? Wait, is your boss? Oh, where's that? Okay. Sensory motor stage is Piaget's first stage of cognitive development in which the infant uses senses and motor abilities to interact with objects and environment. I'll give you a second to write that down. I have a kid making up a test after school. <coughs> now I have to post this video I'm making too. So whoever's listening to this, I hate this. Do I? I never record videos in here, do I? Yeah, you yeah. Just, yeah. 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 You do. You don't like the announcements. We need to Yeah. In the beginning, I used to, and then I decided six periods. Six period doesn't really ask. Doesn't really bother too much. So we get a lot done. All right, you ready? Okay, sensory motor. What is the game you always play with little babies? Peekaboo. Peekaboo. Okay. Peekaboo is what little kids love, and it's a perfect example of how dumb they are. Okay? So when you play peekaboo and they see your face. Stop. What? No, I know. They haven't cognitively developed enough. Okay. So when you play peekaboo, you show them your face. And they're like, oh my god, it's Sam. And then when you cover your face, they think you disappear. <laughs> then, <gasps> you're there. Oh my god, you're gone. <gasps> oh my god, you're there. Oh my god, you're gone. <gasps> you're there. <gasps> Sad. <gasps> you're there. They literally think you disappear. Okay, that is object permanence. Now, please listen. At the bottom of form operation, you're going to see something called object permanence. This is the definition, and then I'm going to explain it here in a second. For your application for object permanence, you're going to write peekaboo with this explanation. Okay, so with object permanence is the knowledge that an object exists when it's not in sight. Next to, in your sensory motor box, okay, you're going to write struggle, uh, struggles with object permanence. Okay, in your sensory motor box, you're going to write struggles with object permanence. During the sensory motor stage, you believe if something is not seen, it's gone. Like, for instance, every time a parent leaves the room and the kid's aware, what does the kid do? Cries. Cries. Because they think the moment you walk out that door, you've fallen off the face of the planet and you are just burning in a pit of flame. Okay? They literally think that you have died and you are never coming back. Okay? They struggle with object permanence. During pre-operational, which is the next tier, they master object permanence. You may want to take a note of that because it's something that kids always get stuck with. Pre-operational is a very big stage 
And so we're going to get to that here in a second. So, an object permanence is the knowledge an object exists when it's not in sight. In sensory motor stage, children are struggling with that. They don't get it, which is why when you hide something from a little kid, they cry, don't they? They don't cry because they're like, oh my god, you're being mean to me. They think it's no longer ever going to exist. And then it's literally just fallen off the face of the planet. Okay? So sensory matter stage, they're struggling with object permanence. They do not master it. They do not master it until second stage. So, any questions about that? We're good? Okay. So, what is the pre-operation? Yes, ma'am. Are you going to tell us what the age of the age is? Yes. Yeah. I have a video of it, too. We're going to play with a kid in a blanket and a ball. She's going to be traumatized when the blanket covers the ball. Because the ball is gone. Huh? No, they figure out like a, like a 12 or 13 months. Yeah, I'll have the date ranges for you on Monday because I have a video and it has all that stuff for it. But I want to get at least the basic because it's going to take me all period to go through all of PJ. And it's a really big deal. I guarantee there's going to be at least three or four questions on your AP exam about PJ. And if you don't know the order, you're screwed. Anyway, so pre-operational is the second stage of cognitive development in which we start using language. So and it's going to start around uh, 12 months. So about one year mark is when the pre-operational. They master object permanence. They understand that just because something's gone doesn't mean it's gone forever. They get it now. They're crying a lot less. Thank God. Okay. So in this stage, we have something called egocentrism. Now, egocentrism, in your application box, I would write master's object permanence, egocentrism, which is down at the bottom, you could write this definition down, is occurring in stage two. Now, egocentrism is the inability to see the world through anyone else's eyes. Now, I do not work at Outback now, but I used to work at Outback. And one year, I was working on my birthday. And a family of like four or five came in with their little kid who happened to be four years old. And the only reason why I know this is because the story requires me to know this. Okay, so on my birthday, I'm at Outback singing the song that literally killed my soul. Happy, happy birthday. No. I sang it perfectly this morning. Happy, happy birthday from the Outback crew. We wish it was our birthday so we can party too. Hey! It was your birthday. It was your birthday. No, but I was singing it for a little kid, and it's my table. Now, I totally suggest when you decide to go to college and you need, like, a part-time job, you really should wait tables because if you're working at, like, a Publix or at a store or something, you can only make so much per hour. If you have intelligence and you can talk to people and you're not a moron, you can make a lot of money waiting tables because it's based on how good you are to a degree. Yes? So the most important thing in order to ensure you get a good tip is that they have to like you. And they have to know you. So, at this table, this little kid who I just sang happy birthday to turned four. And I was like, how old are you today? Because I want the table to like me. So they tip me. And he's like, I'm four. And I was like, wow, happy birthday. And I was like, guess what? And he's like, what? I was like, today is my birthday. And he's like, it's my birthday. And I was like, well, it's mine, too. And he's like, but it's my birthday. I'm four. And I'm like, but it's also my birthday. <laughs> and I was like, it's my birthday. And I was like, what kind of cake do you have? And he's like, I have chocolate. And I was like, well, I had a strawberry cake. He's like, but I have a chocolate cake. <laughs> that little turd did not care. It was my birthday. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. I was charming. But a little turn. He did not care. If you have ever talked to a little kid, do they care about you at all? No. They don't. Good God, no. All they want to do is talk about themselves, and it's their fourth birthday. That's all they want to do. It's my fourth birthday. I'm four. I was like, I don't even 
<laughs> that is egocentrism. They literally cannot see through anyone else's eye. Everything is all about them. They only want to talk about them. They only care about things about them. Anything that happens is literally, it's the first time in the history of the world it's ever happened. Have you ever seen, like, a toddler who, like, stubbed their toe and they just, like, lose their mind? Like, and they're like, I stubbed my toe. And you're like, yeah, great. And they're like, no, like, I heard it, like, boo-boo, you know, like, all that crap. Like, you're supposed to be excited about it. What's up? That's Okay? That is egocentrism. It's the belief that you are the only person that's ever happened to it. Thankfully, most people grow out of it. Not all of them. All right. Centration is the next one. It's a tendency for a young child to focus on only one feature of an object while ignoring all other relevant. What that means is, is that have you noticed when you're hanging out with a little kid, like a toddler, they can only focus on one thing at a time? Like if you're looking at something and they keep saying the same thing over and over again and you're like, but what about this? And they're like, no look and you're like that's great what about this and they're like no look i'm so sorry today i'm all in your business <laughs> I'm gonna lie. okay that is centration um i have a really there's a really cute kid in my video and he's all about centration that is all that man can handle wait is that like i know they have a really short attention span or at least in my experience is that like i don't see like the opposite of that but that kind of comes they only focus on, like, if you ask why do you like something, they'll say one thing. They can't elaborate. They oh, only I care about okay. one simple thing. You know, those types of things. When I show you my video, because going, I didn't have enough time to kind of do both of them fully. On Monday, I'm going to show you my base, my sensory motor, and I'll show you my other ones for each of the stages. Okay, so centration is that one. And then we have conservation. Okay? Now, conservation is one of my favorite things. And it's a cute little girl who we trick. By the way, you can do this for Thanksgiving and really make it work to your benefit. It's going to be great. You can get yourself more pie. You can get yourself more cookies. Feel free to get more turkey, stuffing, anything. If a little kid has it and you want it, this is how you're going to do it. And that is by using conservation. Okay, now conservation is the ability to understand that simply changing the appearance of an object does not change the object's nature. Okay? So, I used to babysit, if you could believe. Okay, these little kids. And they, like, I feel like every other stereotypical little kid, love macaroni and cheese and hot dogs. Okay? Their mom didn't like them eating that much bread, but so I'd always have to cut it up. So here's what a hot dog looks like. So, if I cut it in half, it looks like that. If I cut it in fourths, it looks like that. We all get the basic ratios here, right? We've, we've matured past the pre-operational. Okay? If I gave the big brother, the big bro, this one, and then the little brother, this one, who's going to be cranky? The big brother or the little brother? The big brother. The big brother. Why is the big brother going to be crazy? He got two instead of four. He got more. They don't understand. They don't understand. They know that one, two, three, four versus one, two. Big bro is going to be pissed at the little brother because he got more. Even though you can literally cut the hot dog in front of him. And they will be like, no, that one's so <laughs> no. Then you can play magic. You can cut one and then cut it into four. And you can be like, oh, look at them. Like, oh. <laughs> Conservation is the inability to understand that something just cut into different shapes doesn't mean this and the amount has changed. All right, that's all I got for you today. Goodbye, guys. Have a good break. Woo!